Most people who know you, who recognize your name, know you from your time at the State Department as a spokesperson. Obviously, you have a, a deeper uh, uh, breadth than that, intelligence and treasury, U.S. aid work as well. But as they say, all politics are local. So how do you That's present true. yourself to the voting base there as someone who has a knowledge of and can handle local issues while bringing your foreign policy experience into the fold? Absolutely. So my husband and I uh, joined uh, the lo local temple, Sheriff Israel, um, Orthodox Temple. So we've been going there for the past year um, and really just started when I moved here. I wasn't thinking about politics at all. Uh, I moved to Tennessee uh, for the reason that so many people do, which is a better life uh, for your children. You know, I wanted my daughter to grow up in a place with conservative values. I wanted her to grow up uh, in a place where people aren't censored, where people aren't silenced um, for what they think and for what they believe. And that goes on right now so much around America. It's actually quite scary uh, that you are silenced for your political beliefs, you know, silenced if you work for President Trump. And listen, when I was State Department spokesperson. Uh, I didn't let the Chinese, the Russians, or the Iranians silence me. And as Tennessee's uh, representative and Congress and Middle Tennessee's representative, I'm not going to let anyone silence me there either. And I'm going to stand up for the people here who feel like they may not have a voice. What do you intend to bring to the table in terms of uh, foreign policy, specifically Middle East foreign policy, which you, you yeah. know handled um, um, so, uh, so uh, deeply there at the State Department? Well, I think uh, Middle Tennessee will certainly have an interesting representative in Congress for me. Uh, I am a mother, a wife, uh, a veteran. Uh, I'm Jewish, uh, national security experience, business experience. So I think that there's something in my uh, bio and my background that a lot of people can uh, relate to. And uh, listen, certainly in foreign policy, you know, you and I, you've done many interviews with me. I could go around the world, but let's start with the Middle East because uh, that's was so important for me. Um, I, as you know, I was a part of Abraham Accords uh, with President Trump and Jared Kushner, Mike Pompeo. Um, and it's so funny because when I first started out in my career working in national and foreign policy uh, issues, I, you know, I always thought and hoped that one day in the culmination of my career uh, that we'd be able to have some sort of peace in the Middle East, some sort of breakthrough that I worked on. I didn't expect it to happen midway through my career. Um, and, and when we were able to, with the Abraham Accords, get four peace deals between Israel and Arab states, the first in 26 years. Um, all of this happened, by the way. Uh, I was working on this. I was very pregnant. I had a baby, a little girl, two days after the election. And it will be forever ingrained um, in my memory, sitting in the Oval Office with President Trump twice, uh, whenever he conducted calls in between uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and the leaders in UAE and Bahrain and Sudan. Um, you know, this is just, I remember looking around the room and hearing President Trump conduct the call. This is before we had the really big outdoor event that uh, everyone saw. And when we were in the Oval Office, I thought, how am I going to explain to my daughter what the Middle East used to look like before President Trump? You know, I'm going to have to tell her stories about, well, if you wanted to go to Jerusalem and you wanted to go to Dubai, you had to carry two different passports. Um, and she's going to look at me and think that's as odd as a landline phone. And that's because of President Trump and the world that my Jewish daughter will grow up in, the world uh, that little, you know, Emirati children and, uh, and you know, Arab children in Bahrain and, and Sudan, the world that they will grow up in is that it's perfectly normal to go to Israel uh, for spring break, or it's perfectly normal to see, you know, an Israeli at a souk, uh, you know, in the market in Manama. Um, and for me to be able to be a part of that is exciting. But you just don't, it, it's not magic, as you know, you don't just get there by happenstance. You get get there from four years of putting policies in place that were counterintuitive in Washington. Now, they shouldn't have been counterintuitive. Trump's main philosophy was, let's reward our allies and friends and punish our enemies. Now, that shouldn't be revolutionary thinking, but unfortunately, in D.C. foreign policy establishment, um, it was. We looked at Iran and said, hmm, this is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, designated so by multiple Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, so we're not going to give the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism billions of dollars in sanctions relief. We're going to put the maximum economic pressure campaign on them. When we saw the opportunity to take out the world's largest terrorists and Qasem Soleimani, uh, we did. And I think that, that 
that is what led to peace in the Middle East, is that we had our priorities right. We weren't afraid to stand up for Israel. We weren't afraid to uh, stand uh, for the law of the land in the United States, which says that the U.S. Embassy should be in Jerusalem. Uh, President Trump made big and bold decisions as it relates to Israel that uh, foreign policy analysts, Middle East analysts said for years, well, this will cause World War III. It didn't. What did it cause? It caused peace to break out because there is peace through strength. Morgan Ortega, former State Department spokeswoman, now the candidate for the 5th Congressional District in Tennessee. Bats Lecha, we thank you for joining us, and we'll be keeping tabs on the race going forward. Hopefully, you can join us again down the road. Thank you so much. We'd love to.